And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about death. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about it. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about it. I was reading a little bit this week about somebody who had recently died. It was a man, and um, after the funeral, obviously, they put him, you know, he's in the casket. They close the casket, and the pallbearers pick him up, and um, they're taking him to um, the limousine to, to go to the burial site. And on their way out, they bumped a wall, and they heard, oh, and they opened up the casket, and sure enough, he was alive inside. Went on to live 10 more years, died again. Uh, and this time, when they were carrying him out, the pole barriers, you know, picked him up, put him on their shoulder and carrying him out. And the wife said, watch out for the wall. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? That's such a bad dad joke, but I liked it. I thought that was funny. Uh, but, you know, death really isn't a laughing matter for most of us. And there's a lot of good reasons why. Death, you know, changes the course of our personal history. It's a very tragic experience. I personally have had a lot of people that are close to me in my life die, and it really does shake you to your core. It changes you, and it changes your perspective in a way that nothing else really could. But I think we all want to know, is there life after death? Because it really does seem so mysterious. I mean, it is such a big question because we don't really have a lot of evidence. We really don't have a lot of answers to this really, really big question, what happens when we die? If you are raised in our society, if you attend university and you've never really been to church, you will be raised as what's called a naturalist, which means all there is or all there ever will be is the natural universe around us. It's the doctrine of naturalism. And so this life is all you have to live. You are a product of nothing more than biology. In fact, every single naturalist um, that I know, the person who supports the doctrine of naturalism, is also a determinist. Which basically means you have no free will. And because you have no free will, the product of your choice, the outcome of who you are, is nothing more than something that's been determined by your biology, your DNA. And so you really aren't responsible for your decisions. It's your DNA that has caused you to make the decisions that you make. And so these people are influencing our politics, they're influencing our societies and our school systems. And naturalism, that frame of, of mindset, it does serve a purpose when it comes to solving things like diseases or looking for issues such as mental health because they're only looking for natural answers. But naturalism is ultimately limited because it stops at nature. It can never deal with the metaphysical aspect of us, who we are. And what we're made of, we're made of a soul substance as well. We have a personal identity. Now, of course, as a Christian, I reject naturalism. And a lot of people who are Christians and they're scientists, they reject naturalism as well. But not because they're Christians, but because of the evidence. You know, the first time I've ever heard about near-death experiences, I don't know if you've ever heard that word, they usually call them NDEs, near-death experiences, was at a conference, a faith and science conference about five years ago, just uh, over the other state in Virginia. And this guy got up to speak on near-death experiences, and his name was Dr. Robert Spitzer. And uh, little did I know, he had these weird sunglasses on, and I'm like, is he trying to look cool? But little did I know that Dr. Uh, Robert Spitzer is actually, he's, he's pretty much blind. And he uses these glasses that are able to help him see and shape and form. And I thought it was going to be a completely boring presentation. But he actually, after listening to him, he was my favorite speaker of the weekend. He was funny. He was entertaining. But this is the most amazing point. This guy is a brilliant genius. He is a physicist, um, a, a physicist. I'm not the genius, he is, okay? He is, <laughs> wow, that is so bad. Um, he operates over something that's called physics. <laughs> that is his field of study. And when he gave his presentation, he actually spoke to near-death experiences, which deal with the immaterial reality of the person, of the soul. And at first, when I heard his presentation, I was like, I'm really not buying into this until he was able to present something that really blew me away. And we're talking about peer-reviewed clinical research done by medical professionals all over the world that attest to near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, life after death. I watched a TV interview of him, and this is what he had to say. When he's talking about this near-death experience, this outer body of experience, he says this, some of this veridical evidence and some of the evidence of blind people seeing 
is so well documented now that at this juncture, all the typical explanations like a hallucination or this is the final throes of the brain before death or this is some kind of adverse stimulation of the temporal lobe or this is anoxia, which is basically a deprivation of oxygen, all these typical things completely fall apart because hallucinations or anoxia don't give rise to accurate veridical perception. In other words, they studied these people who died on uh, uh, a table because of cardiac arrest, and they claimed to have out-of-body experience to where they were able to see and hear, and they were able to verify third-party information that would be impossible for anyone to verify. He goes on to say this, and by the way, even stimulation of the temporal lobe, if you don't have an image of color or shape or comparative colors, or comparative shapes in your brain, what image can your physical brain project onto this near-death experience? The answer is none. This is what was incredible. These people who died of cardiac arrest, or they were in a coma, were able to verify information that would be impossible to verify otherwise. I read about one person. She died, and she died of cardiac arrest, and she was eventually um, brought back to life. But she said that she heard her brother-in-law talk about business in the room next to her, and it was very vulgar, it was very derogatory, and she was able to confirm this information that happened while she was dead. Another person had a cardiac arrest and was dead on the third floor of the hospital, had an out-of-body experience, and was able to see a tennis shoe on the outside of the hospital with the shoelace tucked underneath and the left toe rubbed off. And sure enough, when she recounted this information, they climbed out on the ledge and they found a tennis shoe outside with the exact description that she gave. And this is just scratching the surface on these peer-reviewed, clinically surveyed research journals that these medical professionals have actually researched and surveyed and studied people clinically dead for several years. I'll give you a few names of the studies just in case you want to check them out for yourself. There was a study called the Kenneth Ring Study on near-death experiences of the blind. And they studied this highly unusual phenomenon of blind people during their near-death experiences. They studied 31 people, and 14 of them were blind from birth. Now, here's what they had to say. 80% of our 31 blind respondents claimed to be able to see during their near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. And like Vicki and Brad, these are two people that they studied, they often told us that they could see objects and persons in the physical world as well as features of ugly, uh, other worldly settings. This is incredible. In 2012, a neurosurgeon, his name was Dr. Eben Alexander, he wrote in a Newsweek article, this is what he had to say. In the fall of 2008, after seven days in a coma during which the human part of my brain, the neocortex, was inactivated, I experienced something so profound that it gave me scientific reason to believe in consciousness after death. Now, we aren't trying to confirm which religion is right or who's right and who's wrong, but what this research has given us is the ability to understand and accept we have evidential reasons for life after death for the metaphysical reality of our soul, that we are not just natural properties, we are not just DNA, we're not just a physical object, and that's all we ever were, and that's all we ever will be, but there is something more to this life than our body, and there's something more to this life than the grave. And you know, Jesus had a lot to say about the afterlife, and we're going to look at a specific parable. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 16, that's where we're going to be this morning. I read a few other um, researches this week, and another one was called the Von Lommel Study. And these four researchers in Holland, they surveyed 344 cardiac patients, and they were all successfully resuscitated after they had clinically died. They had a heart attack, and they were dead, and they were brought back to life. And these were in 10 different Dutch hospitals. And here's what they had to say. 62% of these patients had an out-of-body experience while their body lay clinically dead on the operating table. And they, they were able to experience certain types of sensory knowledge. They could see, they could hear, and they were able to confirm incredible information that is impossible for them to confirm otherwise. And so what we should take from this is simply this. There is life after death. There is more than this body. 
You know parables, when we look at the Bible, parables are really this story that Jesus would give in the Gospels as his way of illustrating one major point. And before we get into this parable, we need to be a little careful here because sometimes we can make more of the parable than what it was intended to. This is one of the classical mistakes that I have made and people make all the time when they study parables. They want to try to dissect everything about the parable and point to one thing and another thing, and they put things together like a, like a puzzle. And it really becomes overly confusing and people just get lost. Every single parable has one main point that it's trying to prove. But here's the cool news, okay? Here's the good news. Jesus never used fantasy in his parables. He always talked about real things, real places, real times, real outcomes. He never fantasized and just created things out of, out of nowhere, And so when we get to Luke chapter 16, we can see that Jesus is going to use a parable to teach one important truth, mainly the Pharisees were rejecting the word of God. That was ultimately their charge. But he gives us some inside information about life after death and where we go and what happens to us because of the choices that we make. Leading up to this parable, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information. First of all, Jesus has been preaching to the crowds, and the elite religious leaders of his day had been listening to the things that he had to say, and guess what? They didn't like it, okay? They couldn't stand this guy named Jesus because he flew in the face of everything they stood for. They like to take advantage of people and their money. Well, Jesus preached against that. They like to create their own laws and their own religious traditions and come up with their own ideas and then enforce those ideas on everybody around them, and Jesus preached against that. And so in Luke chapter 15, he gives them three parables to illustrate one important idea. God is after things. God is after people who were lost. And they didn't like that. Do you know why? If you were lost, you were a sinner. If you were lost, you weren't worth God. In fact, you were God's enemy. But yet Jesus comes and he says, oh, no, 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 no. God is after the people who are lost. He wants to seek the people who are lost. He wants to heal the people who are sick. And so he gives them these three parables to really prove them wrong, that they had been doing life wrong this entire time. And so they begin to grumble against Jesus. They didn't like the fact that he not only supported God finding lost sinners, but he even ate with them. He fellowshiped with them, which was a big no-no in their day because it meant you endorsed their lifestyle. And Jesus came along and he says, look, I don't endorse their lifestyle, but I love them. And I'm here on behalf of God. And God wants to save them. And so uh, in their grumbling, he gives them these three parables, and he ends this kind of section, this passage with this. God knows your hearts. You're in love with money. You're in love with yourself. You don't care about the people around you. God knows your hearts, and God knows our hearts. And when it comes to the idea of the afterlife, God knows where we're at. He knows our hearts. He knows what's true about us and our perspective on this life and the next. And God will always do the right thing, no matter what. It's really important to accept that as we go into this parable. And so simply put, the Pharisees, they love their money. They live for this life rather than the next one. They sought the approval of man rather than the approval of God. And most disappointingly, they set aside the revelation of God, which exposes the heart of man. And I think when we go through things like death, when we experience death, We may get upset and angry at God, and we may reject God and his word, and we don't want to read it or study it, but that's the worst thing that we can do because the Bible ultimately teaches us about the reality of life after death and what goes on. And so let me read to you the beginning of this parable, starting in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus says this, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who had feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And so here we have this rich man. He's clothed in purple and fine linen. This was the status symbol. It's, it's like wearing the nicest clothes of your day. It meant I am rich and I am wealthy. And he feasted sumptuously, the parable says. It means he never went a day without eating. And that's like most of us. Most of us in this room, we wear nice clothes, and there's not even a day that we go without eating unless we intentionally do it because we're fasting. I mean, we in this nation, we really can understand where the rich man is at. We have everything we could ever want, and that's exactly where this guy is. He lived life. Life was good. He was happy. In fact, 
Based on the Old Testament understanding, this man was blessed by God. This man must have been doing something right because he had all the best stuff. And sometimes we fall into that trap too. We think, well, because we're healthy and because we're wealthy, we must be on God's side. And I think one of the categorical mistakes we make as Americans, as citizens, and don't get me wrong, I love our country, I'm glad I'm an American, but Jesus wasn't the greatest American that ever lived. And sometimes we can make this mistake. America, yes, is a great country, and yes, we do a lot of things that are good and that are right, but just because we're the most blessed nation in the world doesn't mean we have everything right and we're on God's side. You with me? And so that's exactly where this rich man is at. Because I've got all of these things, I must be on God's side. And so we must reject the health and wealth gospel. But then we've got this poor man, this man named Lazarus. And man, he had it rough. He not only had nothing to eat, but he had sores all over his body. And the dogs came and licked his sores, which means his clothing was inadequate. It was enough to where his sores were exposed and his body was exposed and these dogs would come and they would lick his sores and all he wanted were the, was the food that fell off the rich man's table. Typically, dogs would actually eat the food that fell off the rich man's table. And he, so he wasn't saying, look, rich man, I want to sit with you. I want to be equal with you. He was simply saying, let me be nothing more than the lowest of the society. Let me be nothing more than a dog. I am so hungry. I just, want, I just want the scraps. I want the leftovers. I want the things that fall off to the side that nobody wants. And so these dogs licking his sores, he's hungry. He has inadequate clothing. Every day, day in, day out, he lays there begging, wanting some food. And you know what the people thought about Lazarus? I wonder what Lazarus did to make God so angry at him. And sometimes we can fall into that trap too. People get sick, hard times come on them, people are homeless, and we think, man, that person must be doing something wrong. They must be a sinner because God surely isn't blessing that person. And that's exactly where these Pharisees were at. But despite our assumptions about this text, there is something very, very wrong. The rich man has violated a very important law found in the Old Testament. You see, God had this idea for Israel, that Israel would be a nation that would bring about the Messiah ultimately. That was his purpose, that was his plan. And they would love each other, and they would help each other, especially when it came to the poor. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, the Bible says this, God says, there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you for an inheritance to possess. God says, I don't want anybody to go hungry. There shouldn't be anybody that's poor. In fact, they had every seven years, there would be this great celebration that they would throw and people would be released of their debt. God built this in to the Israelite society because that was his plan for Israel. Even even when it came to skillful living or what we call wisdom, the book of Proverbs says this, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and whoever waters will himself be watered. In other words, it is a wise thing to give. It is a wise thing to be charitable. This is, this is the skillful aspect of life. It is unwise to hold for yourself because ultimately you will lose. And so the rich man not only violated Old Testament law, but he just really wasn't living wise. And man, sometimes... I feel like that. Sometimes I look at the poor people around me and I am tempted to think, well, you got yourself in this situation. You must have done something wrong. And I think we all have thought something like that before. And so while being the primary rebuke to the Pharisees here in this passage of Scripture, we really do get a snapshot of what takes place, of what happens when we die. And so the Pharisees, they thought that the righteousness of man and the judgment of God um, was put on Lazarus and he was blessing the rich man. Let's look at what happens. It says in verse 22, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried in Hades, being in torment. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. This is what we call the intermediate state. You know, the Bible talks about our future hope, what we look forward to. We get not just a new heavens, but a new earth with a new body. We're not just going to be floating off in space as a ball of light, but we will actually have the body that God wanted us to have, that he created us to have all along. That is our future hope. We will live, we will eat, we will work, we will play. We will do all of the things that we love to do without the physical consequences and without sin. 
But in between that, we have this intermediate state, and we get a little bit of information about what this state is. Here's the first thing that we see. First of all, Lazarus, it says, was carried by the angels. And so he doesn't have a body, but he has a shape. He has spiritual substance. He isn't this ball of light, but he's a specific metaphysical form in spiritual space. How, the example that I often give is this. You know radio waves. You've got two different frequencies. You've got AM and you've got PM. These, these are two general ways to understand it. And so right now, we are on the AM in this life, right? Okay, I know. Okay, I get it. Okay, I get it. But then we will be on, this is, this is the easy way to explain it. Then we will be on the PM frequencies when we die, right? FM and AM. Wow, I am such a moron. Isn't that awful? <laughs> AM, look, I have kids, okay? <laughs> Why didn't you all shout up and say something? You just let me keep going. You're on a roll. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. So, a.m. and p.m. <laughs> wow. We're not putting this one online. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Got to keep my integrity to the four people who watch our sermons online. <laughs> the other thing that we see is uh, when he's on p.m. time, the other thing that we see is that he's at Abraham's side. Now, the Old Testament saints, they viewed paradise as the epitome and the apex of enjoyment. And Abraham represented everything that they wanted and everything that they should have. And this state that Lazarus was in, though, was, was only temporary. It was incomplete. And Lazarus and Abraham were waiting in hope for a resurrected body. And so here is Lazarus being carried by the angels. Um, he's at Abraham's side. He's at the apex of enjoyment and happiness. And then we've got the rich man who's on AM time. He's in Hades. The biblical word is Sheol. Now, Hades could represent two different things in the Old Testament. It could literally represent the body of the grave, the thing that you went down into. And in that understanding, everybody goes down into Hades. We're all going to die and be buried in the ground. But Hades was also used to reference the underworld, a place where the departed spirits of the wicked went to await the eternal judgment. And this is where the rich man is at. And so if heaven could be thought of like paradise, Hades is part of the invisible creation where those who are wicked go. And that's where the rich man is. It's a place without light. It's a place without hope. And notice what the Bible says. He is in torment. And whether or not this is, this is obviously isn't physical because he doesn't have a body. And so there's some type of metaphysical torment that's taking place in Hades right now. For all of those who are wicked and, and, and they're there. Here's at the end of the day what we know. This is a place where God is not. Peter had a little bit to say about Hades. Here's what he says. Then the Lord knows how to rescue godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And so the Hadean world, this underworld, is a place where people who are wicked, who are not followers of Jesus, who are not Old Testament saints, this is a place where they are kept under punishment. Peter goes on to say in 2 Peter 3, he says this place is a prison. It's solitary confinement. Hell or Hades is not a party. It's not where you to go to go see all your friends. You're in a cell. You're alone. And the worst part about this is he looks up and he sees Lazarus. He sees Abraham. He sees where he was meant to go, where he should have went, but he chose not to. And so it says he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And as I said earlier, to be at Abraham's side is the apex of comfort, is the apex of bliss. And Jesus would often reference in the Gospels that when the end of the world comes, when we die, we'll get the seat at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and there'll be a great feast. And he says people will come from all over the world and they will feast with Abraham. And so he missed out on the feast, the rich man did. And he's in torment. And he calls out in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. And so this torment is represented as some type of burning, this exhaustion, this lack of nourishment and water. And like I said, we, we got to be careful applying to physical realities to this metaphysical state. Here's what we know. God isn't there. It is a prison. It is punishment. And it's not an enjoyable place to go. The rich man is not with Abraham. He is in torment, and he sees Lazarus in this blissful place where he is not, and he says, just send Lazarus to dip the pinky finger in water 
and cool my tongue because it's hot and I'm thirsty and I'm miserable. And so what do we know about this intermediate state? Two things. Number one, when we die, we continue in a state of personal consciousness after death. We are fully aware. We fully recognize what's going on. Just like these near-death experiences that we talked about at the beginning of this message, we are aware. Number two, when we die, we exist in a state without our bodies. You see, the rich man was able to see Lazarus. How did he know who Lazarus was? Here's what I think, and my wife Angel actually brought this up. It's a really good illustration. I watched Avengers Endgame, really good movie. Well, I'm not going to ruin it for you in case you're like, you know, out of touch with the 21st century and haven't seen it, and you want to. But anyways, at one point, they are trying to get the stones, let's put it, and the Hulk is trying to get the time stone. And so he walks up to the person who has the time stone while she has, you know, certain magical powers, and she hits his body, and while the Hulk's body lays back and is, and is by all means dead, the spirit, the person who plays the Hulk is there, and he's talking, and he's interacting with her, and he has the shape and the form of Bruce Banner, the person who is the Hulk. And that's how I envision what's going on here. In our intermediate state, we actually take the form of who we are at our best, and we will be able to recognize and tell who each other are. We may not know everything that's happened on uh, in our life. For instance, if you've lost someone, like my dad, he's been dead over 15 years, he may recognize who I am, but he doesn't know what's happened over my lifetime. And so when I go into glory and I get to see him, he'll see me, and I'll get to tell him about everything that I've done and the life that I've lived and the experiences that I had. And we'll get to celebrate and rejoice together, but we'll know each other. And I think that's absolutely what will happen. You know, we've got a little bit more biblical evidence um, about this. When we look in the Old Testament, for instance, to summon the dead was a very wicked, wrong thing to do, okay? God said, you're not allowed to summon the dead, but he did make an exception for Samuel and Saul. Samuel was dead, and Saul summoned him back from the dead, and he appeared as an old man. He had this body-like form, but it was a metaphysical or spiritual substance. When you look at Matthew chapter 17, it's called the transfiguration. Jesus goes up to the mountain to be transfigured, and there are two people who present themselves there, Elijah and Moses. And yet, Peter, James, and John, who were there with them, are able to see Elijah and Moses, and they can tell who they are. And they actually say, should we build, you know, a church building? Should we build um, a, a temple to worship, these, these things, these altars of sacrifices? Should we build these things for you? And of course, they said no. But what we know is this. Our bodies will die. Our spirits live on, and they take this form of who we were in this life, what I think at our best. And look at what the rich man's request is as we go on. Look at Abraham's response. Abraham said to the rich man, child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all of this, between us and you there is a great chasm that's fixed. So you can't pass between. In order for that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And then notice what he says. In my opinion, this is the most important part of the passage. Then I beg you, Father, send him, being Lazarus, to my father's house. I've got five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place. And look at Abraham's response. No, Father Abraham said. Uh, it says in verse 29, they have Moses, Abraham said, and the prophets. Let them hear them. And look at the rich man's response. No. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone should rise from the dead. And isn't that interesting? Now, sometimes our greatest hurdle to faith isn't evidence. It's not truth. It's a hard heart. It's stubbornness of the mind. It's the fact that we don't want to believe and we haven't taken time to research and survey the evidence. And so here is this rich man, and he's begging Father Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead because the one thing that he's concerned about in this place of torment is not throwing a party for himself, but it's making sure that his family members do not come to this place. And so Lazarus is in paradise, 
And the rich man is in Hades awaiting judgment. And so what do we know about this intermediate state? What do we know about the afterlife? Well, the Bible says a little bit more about this. I'd like to read to you a few more passages of Scripture. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, this is what Paul had to say. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor to me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is better. So here's what we know. When we die, we're not just with Father Abraham, but we are with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Paul says, look, if I'm alive, that means I get to minister the gospel. But if I die, which is far much better, I get to be with Jesus. He also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see, this place is not our home. Jesus is our home. The Christian faith community is our home. Not this life, the next one. And so he says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, being Jesus. So what's the point? The point is this, when we die, we exist. Our metaphysical, immaterial soul goes on. And we will be with all of those who have died before us in faith, And we will be present with the Lord where we will truly feel at home. And look, this isn't a ball of light floating in physical space. This is an immaterial, metaphysical reality. Hebrews gives us a little bit more information. After he talks in Hebrews 11 about all of those who have died before us in faith, great giants of faith, some of them were sawed in half. They were literally cut between their stomachs. They were killed, thrown in a den of lions, and we know about a lot of these stories in Old Testament history, and yet they never gave up their faith. And here's what the Bible says. You've come to Mount Zion when you die. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable angels in festival gathering. And so angels will be there. This is the place where angels live in this heavenly intermediate state. And look at this, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, everyone who has lived a life of faith, the angelic beings, the theophany of God, which is how God presents himself in the material or immaterial world, everyone is there, and we will be with them, and we will live with them in time, metaphysically and immaterially. You know, Revelation 6 gives another really good picture, and we're not going to read it for time's sake, but he sees souls under the throne of God, and these specific souls that he sees were persecuted for their faith. They were killed, and they cry out, how much longer, God, before you give judgment to the earth, before you make everything that was wrong right? And God says, in a little while, I will. And so John sees this incredible picture of the heavenly throne room where God presents himself as the king of the universe, where angels come and go, where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people of faith are there at present with God and with the Lord, and they worship, and they rejoice, and they experience some type of passing of time. But that's what we exist and we we live in. You know, Hebrews also says in chapter 12, this is my favorite part, and this is what brought me a lot of comfort and a lot of peace. After discussing, as I said in chapter 11, these great people of faith, here's the encouragement that he gives us. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so closely clings to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He says, all of these people who have died before us are a cloud of witnesses cheering us on, giving us encouragement. Keep running. Don't give up. Don't fall short. Don't give up your faith. Keep running. Have the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Follow after God. Don't let go. Don't forsake God. Keep pushing through. You know, I think we all know family who have passed away in Christ and out of Christ. And you know, me personally, I have my father. Um, He was a Christian. He was a believer in God. Um, He went to a denominational church for five to six years, and then six months before he died, uh, he went back to a Christian church where they took the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and they preached biblical truth. And whether or not you go to a denominational church, I'm not saying you're going to heaven or hell. I'm just saying this was my dad's story. And, you know, when he passed away, I was 
always just unsure about where my dad would be. But I think God's grace was certainly applied to him the more I grow and mature and understand um, the Bible. And I think my dad is cheering me on. I think I have a cloud of witnesses who are looking at me and my life, hoping the best for me, wanting me to run the race with everything that I have because they want to see me again and they want to experience life with me again. But I also have family who have died outside of Christ. You know, the last church that I was at, I had to end up picking up a part-time job. Um, So I was at church, and I also worked for a part-time job. Well, one of the ladies that worked at this place, her name was Nikki, and she had actually gone to the same church that I went to, but we had two different services, early service and and late service, and I always went to the later service. Well, she went to the early service, and she was dating a guy in the congregation who was a Christian. And so we got to know each other a little bit better, and uh, I discovered this about Nikki. Nikki, who was, you know, in her mid-20s at this point, she had actually lost her best friend, who was 20 years old, in a tragic car accident. And Nikki had been attending church for quite some time, but she had never obeyed the gospel, and she never was baptized into Christ. And so I asked her why, and she shared this story with me. She was at her hospital when she was laying on her deathbed, holding her hand as they pulled the life plug from her body and she died and they were close like sisters and her fear was this if I obey the gospel it means my friend who wasn't baptized is in hell and I said look first of all God is good and he is just and he is always going to do the right thing and so even if this young lady who 20 20 years old is still very very young but even if this young lady did die And God didn't accept her soul. And she was in Hades, this place of torment. There's a rich man in the Bible who didn't live a very good life. And he went to Hades as well. And let me read to you what was on his mind and what he had to say. And so I opened up the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And I showed her the scriptures and his request. Send somebody back to my brothers that they would not come to this place. If you have friends and family that have died outside of Christ, yes, it can be a great discouragement to you. And I certainly understand that. But even if they are not in the presence of God, even if they are in Hades awaiting judgment, the one thing on their mind is for you not to come to this place, to accept the word of God, of Moses and the prophets, and of the New Testament, to embrace the grace that God so desperately wants to give you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. And after I explained this to Nikki, she was tearful and she was crying. And later on that week, she decided to be baptized into Christ. And we celebrated, and it was a wonderful, great thing. What I take from the rich man, from the, from the parable of the rich man Lazarus, is simply this. His point of the parable, so the Pharisees, don't reject the word of the prophets. You Pharisees, you lovers of money, you rejectors of people. But this inside information we get confirms what we know in science. And what I think everybody in this room really does know, there is certainly more to this life. And when we die, we will either be present with the Lord or we will be in Hades awaiting our ultimate punishment. And my encouragement to you is you've got people in heaven who want you there. You've got people in heaven who want you there, and they are cheering you on. Don't give up. And you've got people that you love that may be in Hades, and they are likewise cheering you on. Don't come to this place. And so everybody in this room has a decision they they have to make. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? What choice are you going to make? If you don't really know about this Christian stuff or this Jesus thing or this life after death, look at the evidence. Research the arguments for Christianity. Look at the science and the information that is out there about the afterlife, about the existence of the soul and what goes on. And make a rational, good, sound judgment. Don't be like the rich man. Don't be like the five brothers and have a hard heart. Let's stand and let's pray.